do we not have the intro? David, I'm going to need to see proof that you're not just messing with me. I clicked the button. I totally clicked uh, it. Uh huh. Uh huh. You, you're not supposed to click the button. I didn't click the button. I clicked it. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> hello, friends. Um, welcome to another 60 minutes of obviously unscripted.net entertainment. Our mission is to empower the .NET community, that's you, to achieve more. Uh, I am today's host, Cam Soper, with my co-hosts, uh, David Pine and uh, Frank Boucher. Um, and we would like to welcome today's guests, uh, returning to the stream, Jason Bach. Jason, tell us a bit about yourself, what you're about, and so forth. Sure. Uh, again, my name is Jason Bach. I'm a staff software engineer at Rocket Mortgage. I've been there for almost four years now. Before that, I spent most of my career as a consultant doing all sorts of various things. Um, I'm also a Microsoft MVP. I've been that, that award, I think I've got 17 years now. Um, also written a bunch of books and articles and do a bunch of speaking at conferences as well. So I like, I like software. I like, I like writing code. <laughs> awesome. Very cool. And as I remember, last time you were on the stream, you showed us some really cool wizardry that we could do with source generators. Yeah, I actually, uh, when I was practicing yesterday, I looked up and I'm like, when did I do that? And I think that was January of 2001. So yeah, almost just over three years ago. Do you mean 2021, not 2000? Oh, yeah. yes. yes. Yeah. Yes, that's, that's a very long time ago. He was doing it before they existed. People. I think that was before YouTube was even created. Um, I was that far ahead of the game. Uh, no, that was <laughs> he, he was writing .NET content before there was a .NET. <laughs> yeah. One day, people, you will understand. Right. You, you, are, <laughs> you are right. 2021. That is correct. Awesome. So, all right. So I, you've come back to the stream and um, I remember you, you in the, um, you know, we have a form to fill out to tell us what you want to talk about. You basically just said, hey, you, you've learned some lessons since the last time you came on and showed us source generators. So you wanted to come back and show us more magic. Yes, some magic, but also hopefully some guidance, some tips, some some things to keep in mind if you do want to go down the path. Because again, I when, when this feature came out, I was really excited about it. <clears throat> I thought it was really interesting. One of the things I focus on as a developer or that is kind of where my passions lie is with code analysis and metaprogramming and compilers and that type of stuff. And when I heard about source generators, I went, oh, this is really cool. This looks like a, a really fun thing to, to exploit or to do you know, interesting things with. And over the last three years, I've learned a couple of things about what's potentially maybe the right thing to do or not so much the right thing to do and where it's appropriate and things like that. Um, so I do have a slide deck, not that much in there. I'm going to just use it to go through a really quick overview of what source generators are. And then I'll spend most of the time on some specific topics that we can go through that will hopefully give that guidance for people. So let's get this running. Okay. So lessons learned writing source generators. So first of all, what is a source generator? You can think of it as like a factory. So in a, in a factory, you have a bunch of parts that are at the beginning of the assembly line, or you're going to fabricate those parts. And as the component goes down the assembly line, you start adding more and more to it and refining it until hopefully what comes out at the end in this picture would be a complete car. And that's kind of the way you can think of source generators in that your raw materials are code. So you're going to have code on the beginning part of the pipeline and if you think of a compiler, there's a whole bunch of steps in that in that pipeline to parse it, to find, you know, to create syntax trees, to maybe do some analysis on them, whole bunch of stuff. And then eventually you, you emit an assembly in the case of the .NET compiler. What you're doing with a source generator is participating in that compilation pipeline at some point so that you can look at code that exists and generate new code. So to be clear on this point, 
you're not modifying code that exists. You're going to be generating code based on what currently exists. So sometimes people hear about this feature and go, oh, I can go in and I can completely modify what the code is doing. And that's not what a source generator does. It's only additive. Okay. You can look at other things during this process. You can look at things that are called additional files if you want. Um, those are things like JSON files or XML files. You can read those in and potentially create code based on what is in those files. You can also look at services, you can call them, but you're highly discouraged to do that. Because again, you're part of the compilation pipeline and you wanna make sure that what you're doing is gonna be as fast as you possibly can make it. Your source generator is just code. If you look down at the bottom there, you can see that's a very small definition of what a generator looks like. So you may be tempted to say, well, I, I'm C-sharp code as well, so why don't I go off and do all these things? but that could really hamper performance because your generator is running. In fact, when I do a demo here um, in a moment, I'll show you that as I add things, the generated code will change as I do those changes. Okay, so you, you wanna keep in mind to keep and do that quick. As I mentioned before, I did, this, did a talk on source generators almost three years ago. And at the time there wasn't anything within .NET itself that was using it. That's changed at this point. These are some examples of where source generators are used to help well, maybe make your code run faster, consume less memory and so on. The, the regex one is fairly new. That's a really cool one because I, I don't know anything about source or not source generators. God, I hope I know <laughs> something about them if I'm doing a talk on this. Um, regexes, I'm, I'm really not handy with regexes, but- uh, Is anybody? Well, you know, I guess this is where you just tell Copilot to write you the, the regex at this point and it just does it. But I mean, the, 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 yeah, the feedback I've heard is, is you've got a problem that you're trying to solve with regular expressions. Now you have two problems. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but what this new thing does with source generators is it doesn't do all of the construction of the underlying machinery at runtime. It does it at compile time. And so there's definitely perf wins that you get on that. I think Stephen Tao did an article on that when this feature came out and gets into all, like as he would do, gets into all the details about how this is better. But it's really cool to see source generators used for something like regex to make that perform better. Okay, so this is this is a feature that's actually now showing up in places that are in the box to, to make things better in our .NET lives. So I'm gonna go through a quick demo of a source generator that I've spent a fair amount of time on when I have my off time and I wanna just play with stuff. This is a, a package called rocks. So I'm actually gonna just bring up some code here. And I also, I gave a bunch of links to the, the host. So if you wanna, if, if you can figure out which ones are which, you can uh, share those along the way um, so people can look at this stuff if they like. So this package called rocks is a mocking framework. And some people like mocking frameworks like MOQ and substitute. Some people don't. Uh, I, my, my intent is not to debate the validity of using a mocking framework. I'm mostly just showing I have one, it's a source generator based one, and, and how does it actually work? I'm not gonna go through all the details of this, but let me just show you a quick demo as to what happens when you use this in your code. So I have a solution one, so you can tell I just created this locally, this isn't anything saved somewhere, with class library one, great names, and what I did is created a very simple example of when you would use a mocking framework. I have a repository that's going to retrieve this class here or an instance of this class, this record with a value. Okay. And in my code, I also have a service that takes a reference to an instance of that repository. When somebody calls get, it's going to turn around and call retrieve. Okay. The example is simple, but if you've used mocking frameworks, this is where you'd say, hey, I want to create a mock of repository so I can set up some expectations and confirm them or verify, verify them in my tests. So in my tests here, in my test project, if I actually go look at the test project, you'll see that I have a reference to rocks here. Okay. So I just reference it within NuGet and then I go into my tests here and then you'll also see that I have an attribute, rock create. Okay. In my library, this attribute can exist at the method level, class level, or assembly level. 
but you can have duplicates of these and I'll only generate the code for each type that you're asking to basically make a mock for, okay? So it's kind of up to you as how you wanna organize it. But when you add this attribute, this type here is created, okay? And this is what is used to create expectations. For example, I expect that with methods, the retrieve is gonna be called with a specific ID. And when that's called, I can also return a value of a specific instance of that information class, okay? So that's the expectation that I'm setting up. And then I pass in an instance of that mock to information service. We call get, which we know is gonna call retrieve. We get out a instance of information. We check that the value is what we expect it to be. And then we also see that um, our expectations are met. So if I run this test, it already is green. It's got the green check mark there, but you can see that if I run it again, that it definitely is green, okay? And what's cool about the, the source generator approach is for one, as an author, if I really wanna look at this, I can just F12 and I can go into the code that's generated. It doesn't matter for our, our conversation here what this does, but this is just all the code that I generate. And to illustrate that point about how this can react to changes, I'm gonna pull this down here down below, and then let's move this up just a little bit. And I'll come back to, let's see, let's get this here. And if I go to the repository here, and of course, there's a student saying, of course you want to delete method, why wouldn't you? Um, if I hit that, you'll see down below now that we have a delete method, which we didn't have before. So we could also set expectations on that. And if I remove that, you'll see that that method goes away. So we get that real time changing of what if what I have defined in my interface here, if that changes, they'll immediately be picked up in the, the mocking code that's created. Okay. Um, so let's see. As, as, you're, as you're going through this, we do have a question real quick uh, yeah. from one of our viewers. They're specifically asking, you know, as like a, a .NET developer, you know, what's the value proposition of using a source generator? Like you talk to kind of what they are, but like, why, why would you want to use them? That's a really good question. It actually leads to something I was going to just say. So that, okay. that works out well. Perfect. Um, one, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them is it takes away the, the need for a developer to create a bunch of boilerplate code. So, <clears throat> you know, there, there's all sorts of things like with serialization, with mocking and so on, that if I wrote all of that stuff out by hand, that would be incredibly tedious. But I can use a source generator to just have this one line of code here that sets up all this code infrastructure that I can just use now in my test. Uh, if I write a serialization source generator, I can use that to potentially write out all this really compact, nice, fast uh, serialization code for whatever library I'm using. And that's also another thing to keep in mind is that a source generator doesn't mean that suddenly things are going to be faster, but you do have the ability to potentially do some things where the resultant code will be faster and or potentially consume less memory. Again, that's not a guarantee, but it can happen. One thing I want to show here, this is why I like the question, because it's leading to this site, this is called Benchmark MockNet, not .NET. That's a great, you know, um, library to do performance testing on your code. But this is a repository that somebody created that looks at different cases for mocking libraries and says, how do they perform? It uses Benchmark.NET. So I added rocks to it just to see how it does. And honestly, to my surprise, what I found interesting is if you look at like Rox's performance in all these different tests, it is typically the fastest and consumes the least amount of memory. The stub is basically the, is the baseline that is used in the test, which is if you just did things by hand and you didn't have a mocking framework in place, how would it perform? So that's always gonna be the fastest, but then that's used to compare to the other ones. And with Rox, we, we can see that we always get really good performance with very little memory allocation. And this was run with an earlier version of Rocks. With eight, I've done some other work to make it even better. So that's another reason why you may want to use source generators. Of course, 
there's caveats in play with that. And that's why I'm doing this talk because there are some things you definitely have to keep in mind when you're writing a source generator. Okay. So, um, and yeah, I can see somebody also commented about that you need to restart. I will come back to that on Visual Studio. I will come back to that point. Um, so, but that's absolutely one thing you have to be uh, cautious about. So this is just the list. I'll show it here right now of things that I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to have the slide deck up anymore, but I'll go through each of these points real quick and, and talk about why this is something you want to keep in mind. But before I do that, I also want to say, I think the overarching thing to keep in mind with source generators, generators is maybe not write one. <laughs> you know, there, there is, <laughs> which I'm That's glad you're awesome. laughing. Uh, <laughs> I agree. I, I, I maintain one myself. Yeah. Don't write one. Don't. It's, there is, I don't want to say a barrier to entry, but there is a, let's call it a, a rock surface you need to climb to, to get comfortable and get familiar with them. They can be overused. I know I've did some experiments early on that I've looked back at later and went, yeah, that sucked. That was not a good idea at all. You know, um, it just didn't fit very well with what source generators are there for. Source generators are part of the compiler API or Project Rosalind. That was the code name. And there's absolutely no reason why you may go, hey, I want to generate code. Maybe not use a source generator. Maybe a better approach would be is to write a custom MS build task. Maybe you can use a .NET tool that's an executable that's packaged as a NuGet package, and then people can install that and run that on the command line to generate code. That might actually work out better based on like you, you may need to call services to generate your code. Package it up as a .NET tool. You still get all the benefits of the compiler API, but then you don't have that thing where it's running within the compilation process all the time. So, you know, that, that's one overarching thing here of all the points is keep in mind that even though this looks cool, and it is, don't get me wrong, this is cool stuff, it also requires knowledge about how things work with the compiler and also is it the right context to write them with what you're doing okay that being said now i'm going to say yeah you're convinced i want to do this i've got a case where this makes sense so let's talk about some things that you want to keep in mind with okay so i'm going to keep looking down because i got all my notes here on my screen below um, one of the first things to keep in mind is that your your source generator is going to be in a project that needs to target .NET Standard 2.0. Okay, so if I come to my, my rocks project here, and if I go into the actual CS project file, you will see right here that I'm targeting .NET Standard 2.0. The, the long and short of it is that when this is being referenced by people in their projects, they may be building it on the command line, but they're probably going to use a tool like Visual Studio or Rider. And in Visual Studio, there is kind of a restriction in terms of VS actually has to load a version of the runtime. And right now, it's .NET Framework. And so you can't have two of those running within the same process. So um, again, some of these points I'm going to be doing a little bit of hand-waving on. I gave some links to our friendly hosts that hopefully they can share um, that are from the actual compiler team about how to use generators. There's a cookbook there as well, which is really super helpful. And they talk about some of these points that I'm going to be making as well. So this one, you just have to say, I'm going to target that in standard 2.0, which at first glance, it may not seem like a big deal. But the problem with this is that as time goes on, that is staying static. And we're now in .NET 8 world. And in a, you know, what, six-ish months or something like that, we're going to be in .NET 9, and there's going to be new APIs and these things added on. And there may be something that you look at and go, hey, I really want to use this when I'm building my source generator. And you can't because you can't reference it or whatever. It's not targeting .NET standard itself. So keep this in mind. As you're building your package, you may not be able to reference other packages because of this restriction. But as I'm also going to mention later on, you probably don't want to mention you don't want to reference a bunch of packages in source generators because that can be a pain in the butt as well. Okay. So that's the first one. You're going to target that in its standard. You're also going to use iIncremental generator. So if I come to my generator here, you'll see that I implement this interface. I also attribute my generator with this attribute. 
But the key point here <clears throat> is this interface. When source generators first came out, there was an interface called I source generator. Okay. And that's the last time you're going to see me show that because you shouldn't use it. It was the first iteration of this. Long story short, there were some potential perf problems with using that interface. And so this is the next version of, of source generators, which is this I incremental generator interface. And you want to, you're you going to implement this one method initialize. Okay. But if you see examples out there that show using I source generator, just ignore it or realize you're going to have to refactor that to use it within the the way I incremental generator is defined. Okay. So that's the next one. Here's another one that you want to keep in mind. This, this method right here for attribute with metadata name. Okay. You may be wondering, why am I bringing this up? Um, by the way, I, I have my screen hiding the chat. So um, to my friendly hosts, if somebody comes up with a question, just tell me to shut up and answer it. And I, and I will gladly do it. I just can't see them as they're going by right now. I, I um, was just chatting and saying that I still have to refactor my source generator because I use the old one and I'm a bad open source developer as a result of that. <laughs> uh, no, you just, just don't have time. <laughs> well, that's the other thing is if you, if you dove into this right away yeah. and that was the only interface you had, um, it still technically is okay for very specific scenarios, but for the vast majority of cases, you want to use this incremental generator interface. If you're building one from scratch, absolutely use this one. Okay. Um, the source, the other one still works. It's just not the one you should be targeting. So um, speaking of new APIs, this for attribute with metadata name wasn't out there originally, and this was added sometime later on. And this is one that you really want to consider targeting. And what do I mean by that? If I come back to that little demo that I was showing before, I have rock create here. Okay. So this is an attribute I've defined that lets developers say, I want to create a mock for this type. Now in my generator itself, you'll notice that down at the bottom here, I'm targeting that attribute. I'm basically saying, I want to get information when people put that attribute in their code. And when I call for attribute with metadata name here, I'm able to start looking and seeing that, oh, there's these attributes here. Is it generic? I'm going to look at the, the type argument to pull out the actual um, type symbol that represents what they want to mock and so on. But the reason I mentioned this method here is because there's some perf benefits to saying, I want people to put an attribute in their code so that I can pick that up during the compilation pipeline. Okay. You can, if I do a dot here, there is a create syntax provider method. And what you can do in here is say, I want to look for basically anything that's within a syntax tree, like a class definition, like a method infigation and so on. And that works. Okay. Um, I should be really clear here. My point is not to like show how all the ins and outs of building one. These are just, there's lots of good information on that. So if you're like, what, what is this method? What are you doing with Rosalind? What's a syntax tree? That, that stuff you can look up later. This is just purely on if you're doing a source generator, what you need to keep in mind. So with this method, you'll, you can see over on the right there that there's a, a funk of syntax nodes. Syntax nodes are basically these pieces of a whole syntax tree. Okay. So I could write a generator that says, hey, I want to find all method invocations in a syntax tree. And that's what that first predicate will do. And then you'll see the second one there where you have a transform. And then that's where you'll say, okay, I have a method invocation. Is this one that I actually care about? That works. That's okay. But the recommendation is to use an attribute. It not only gives you some perf benefits, but it also is more explicit, like the developer that's using your library has to say, I want to have a mock generated in this case. I'm going to put that attribute there. And it's not just going to dynamically discover it based on the existence of, um, of some method invocation. Okay. So you're going to build a source generator, try to see if you can have an attribute that basically is what's going to kick it all off. Yep. Okay. Uh, next one, immutable read-only data models. And what do I mean by that? So in your source generator, at some point, if I come down here, 
you're going to see I'm going to call add source. And that's the method that allows me in my example that I showed before to bring up, when I did F12 here, the generated code. Okay. So add source is what's actually going to add that source to that project. Now, <clears throat> when you are doing all of your analysis to say, should I actually generate code based on what's going on in the application? What's going to come out of this for attribute with metadata name is an incremental values provider of mock model information. Okay. And that's what I'm going to use down here at the bottom to create output. But as I said before, there's this whole pipeline, there's this whole factory going on with a compiler. And in the compiler API, these syntax trees, these models, these semantic models, all that stuff is being regenerated constantly as immutable views on your code. Okay. So if I actually said in my generator, I'm going to pull out the actual type symbol here, or whatever that mock name or whatever that mock type is that I want to mock. And that came out all the way down here in the create output. Now what's happening in the pipeline is it can't determine um, every time the compiler runs or does any incremental changes because you typed in something in your code. And what it can't do anymore is cache that. And that's really important because it can't do equality on the stuff that's coming out of the compilation process. What you should rather do is create your own models that are read only, that are equatable. And so a great way to do this, for example, if I go into my source generator here and say type reference model, you notice that it's a record. Yeah. So, and if I look at all the properties that I have down below, they're all things like strings or Booleans or enumerables. There's also an equatable array. This is a type that has been made by somebody else that you're free to share and use, which is really helpful if you're a source generator because it actually does, um, it, it says basically are two arrays equal the way you want them to in a source generator, okay? And you wanna have this view that's basically projected out of your generator that has all of the information you need, but doesn't have references to some of that compiler stuff that you're given. So for example, this, this type reference model that I created, you'll notice that it gets an I type symbol, that's from Rosalyn. And I use that to pull out a whole bunch of information that I'm gonna need, but I don't reference this anymore. It's only used on the constructor, okay? And again, that's that's helpful in terms of performance in your generator. If you don't do that, you can run into some per performance issues because and you and the, the compiler can't cache that things it can't cache effectively what you're doing with that source generator. For example, um, just to bring home that point a little bit, if I came back into my information repository, and I just typed in public class foo, just another class. Okay, That has nothing to do with my source generator. But because I've created this immutable data model, um, the, the changes are going to show that from, the, from what I created originally to what the compiler is going to say is now in my tree, from my view, is no different. And so I don't have to actually go through and generate code anymore. So that's an optimization that has that happens. If I typed in here static void foo, which you can actually put in static members and interfaces, that also wouldn't cause another re another code generation to have happen because I don't I don't create mocks for those. So when you create your source generator, you want to make sure that you create your own model for what you need to generate source code. So something else to, to keep in mind. Um, naming collisions. <laughs> when you create a source generator and you publish it on NuGet, you're going to find out that lots of people write code in lots of different ways. And in, in some unexpected ways that you may not have anticipated, like just maybe how they structure their code or, or how they write their methods or things like that. There, there's there's a fair amount of leniency in C Sharp in terms of how you can do things. And that can bite you if you're not thinking of the fact of, I gotta be defensive around what basically anybody could do. 
Okay. So there's two specific things I want to bring up here. And I'm going to go into that code that I generated. The first one is you want to use fully qualified names. So if you see this code that I generated, I've got global with the whole class name here or like global system grid. I would never write code this way myself. Okay, that that's just a recipe for pain. That 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 would suck. I would maybe you do that as your standard. Great, but I would not do this. It's just a lot of noise. But when you're writing a source generator, you're not particularly caring too much about how the code is shaped or how it looks. You know, you don't need to have it use tabs or spaces based on what other people use. You know, you can, you're really more concerned about providing that value to the person that's consuming your source generator. Okay. Um, so if you, you see these names, it doesn't really matter because it's still going to be a GUID. That's what's important. And the reason why you want to have fully qualified names is because then you don't have to worry about naming collisions. Okay. You don't have to worry about putting a set of using statements like at the top of your generated code. You This is going to be explicit to that type. And it makes things so much easier when you're generating your code just to get a fully qualified name. And there's ways to do that in the compiler API. Okay, So you definitely want to use fully qualified names. You also want to do this because it is possible, and there is a case I'm going to bring up and just when I talk about this, it is possible that you can have a type with the, the same fully qualified name in two different assemblies. It's rare, but I found out um, I have a, a project that I use to do a whole bunch of testing on rocks where I reference all these other NuGet packages. And there are two libraries. One is from a third-party vendor called Dispose, and another one is um, called DNS Client. They both have a type called DNS Client DNS Query Options. And then even if you do this, they're not going to be different. But what you can do is you can alias package references. So you basically put an alias in your package reference in your project file, and then you can detect that using all the compiler API stuff. And so then you would actually put here the name of the alias, and then you know which one it's coming from. So using fully qualified names gives you that ability to basically reference anything, and then you're being defensive against whatever somebody could do in terms of referencing other packages, okay? The other one with naming is collisions. So down here in my retrieve method, my argument here has the name of ID, okay? You notice I have an at sign in front of it. And the reason I do this is I always put the at sign, that's for a literal name, with anything I'm declaring because what happens if somebody has a, a parameter name called event? That's perfectly legal, but you need to put the at sign in front of it to do that. Or if you wanna have a um, parameter called field, same, well, not yet, that's right, not yet. That may come in a future version of C-sharp. But these keywords you can use, you just have to put the at sign in front of it. So it's just easier to always put the at sign in front of it because then you never have to worry about, is this a keyword, is it a contextual keyword? You don't care. So that's being defensive. Another one is based on your context. What happens if this name was handler? When I generate my code, I create a variable called handler. That would be a collision. So I have in my source generator a class called variable naming context that I say, here are all the names that exist within this context. If I want to create handler here, what I would actually generate is like handler one. Ugly, but it keeps the two different. Okay, So you have to think about, I don't have control over how people are going to name their parameters. I have to be defensive to not have a collision between those parameters. Okay, so you you want to watch out like, again. What's the hardest problem in in computer science? Naming things. It's also being defensive around what people name things as well. So you want to you you want to be defensive against those things. Okay. Um, another one is package references. Um, I'm not going to get too deep into the details of this. Again, the, the cookbook that comes from the, the compiler team talks about this in more detail. But the long and short of it is your project, if I come back to rocks here, your project here is 
just a class library, but it has some special usage. It, it's basically going to be referenced as an analyzer project. Okay. And that's why you see way down below here um, that I'm outputting my assembly to the specific directory. Okay. So when somebody references it, they get all the goodness of my source generator. But what that does is it makes it somewhat harder for you if you want to reference a package yourself and use that when you're doing your source generation. Okay. Um, again, read that document, but it talks about how you have to actually start creating like a specific PKG directory and, and reference that. And then if that has dependencies, um, I have a story internally that we tried to use a generator in one case and we ran into this exact problem because the dependencies and those dependencies and how they get referenced can start to become a nightmare. So if you really need to reference a package, that you want to use as your as your source generator is running, you have to be careful because how it's going to be packaged up and referenced by another project can cause some problems that you didn't anticipate. You typically just say, hey, I want to reference this package from NuGet and it just works. With source generators, it's a little bit more work. So if you can avoid it, it just makes your life a little bit easier. Yeah. Um, Next one is be nullable, but be forgiving. So with C Sharp, I believe it was version eight, if I remember back in history, that the concept of nullable reference types was introduced. And so you could say you could attribute a parameter as being string question mark. And so that's saying it doesn't check to make sure that's going to be not null, but it's basically saying I, I could accept a null. If I don't have the question mark there, then it's saying, I'm expecting that you don't give me a null. And there's a bunch of stuff in the compiler to help enforce that. And at this point, all of the APIs that are within .NET proper have all the annotations on there that make sense for what that API does. When you're building your code, you wanna be cognizant of the fact that you don't always have as much control over things as you really want in terms of how things work with nullable reference types. So what I found is, if I go back to my code here, you'll notice that this ID parameter, which is a GUID, that's a struct and it will never be null. I still put the, what they call the damn it operator. <laughs> that's the, the uh, not the official name, but that's null the- Null forgiving yeah, operator. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but th that's the professional version of that, of that exclamation. But, but damn it, it's- <laughs> It's not, I'm, I'm, not it's that not we, I'm not saying that we used that term in the training module around uh, null forgiving operators um, and then got smacked on it by by the standards team. He is, he is saying that. That's what happened. I am saying that. We, we <laughs> used that term in the training module and we got smacked on it. Yeah. Um, so you may wonder, why am I doing that? You know, And I also have it here with the result that that is something that gets um, passed back when this method completes. It's just simpler to do that, to always say, I'm expecting these things to always have a value. Okay. Um, even if they're null and they get they need to get past into things where they have a null, just putting this here gets rid of a whole bunch of potential warnings that may show up depending upon how the person has configured their project. You know, and I love the statement. I've heard it from somebody. Um, uh, I think it was Jared on uh, the compiler team that warnings are just errors that lack conviction. And I love that. Um, well, that's which is it's true. That. But when you're building a source generator, you may generate code that violates how somebody's configured their project. And so it's just simpler to always, in this case, put this exclamation point there just to say, compiler, shut up. It's just going to happen. If somebody passed in something that was null here that wasn't expected, that's kind of on them. They shouldn't have done that in the first place. Okay. So this these types of things are things you want to think about because you don't want your code necessarily to start creating a bunch of warnings that are errors that really don't need to show up in the first place. Yeah. Reloading. Yeah, like I said, this this is what somebody asked before. What about reloading? Reloading sucks. <laughs> and what do I mean by that? So if I go into my rocks project, you'll notice that I have, let's cancel out of that and just close this, close that. There we go. I have, and I'll move my cursor over here and just zoom in on this a little bit. I have well, I have three test projects, but two that I want to bring up here right now, which is the tests. That is 
the unit tests, and then I have integration tests. What is the difference between these two? So with my test project here, I'm gonna go into one of them here, open generics. I'm actually in the next version of rocks. I have it now where I support where you can pass in an open generic to the, the rocking, the rocking rocks infrastructure. And it will actually create then if you look down below here, wow. a class that is, that has open. So you could then create something that, you know, you can define the types at runtime. So that's, let, that's really, that's a really interesting feature because I, I know that, you know, even just generics and attributes were somewhat new. And someone commented that on that on the stream earlier, uh, but to have open generics, like that's next level. That's crazy. <laughs> well, and I'm th thank you for going wild well because uh, it was also kind of fun to get this to actually work. Yeah. Um, for some de definition of fun, like, is this what you do on a Saturday night is right. build this stuff? I'm like, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> um, so, so I'm glad somebody did the, the wild. Wow. Thank you, David. Um, but in this test, you'll notice that this is just using raw string literals. One of my favorite features in C Sharp. It's so small, but it's so useful, especially when you're generating code. Because what I can do is just say, here's a snippet of code. This is all in a raw string literal. Here's what I'm expecting to have generated. And there are some libraries, if I get all the way down at the bottom here, down here, this test assistance is a class I wrote, but it's using, if I go into the project here, it's using this library here and also this one as well. And these provide a whole bunch of helpers to make it so that you can write this code and say, I expect my code to generate this code. And then it does a diff on it. If it doesn't match, it will yell at you and say, hey, something's not the same here. And even if it's what you expect, if it doesn't compile, it will fail as well. So that's cool. You want to do that. Testing is awesome. You want to test all your code. That's something I, I always champion on any project I'm on. You got to have tests. Okay. But this is just unit tests. This is referencing my project as a normal class library. This integration test project references my project as an analyzer. And so now, now there's a difference here. What happens is in this project, which has a bunch of integration tests to so show this open generic test here, here's my interface, here's my rock create. And now you can see I've got that as an open generic and I can do it differently down here as well. But this is actually executing the code to make sure it's really doing what I expect it to do. Okay. So I need to actually have the analyzer run as it would if I was referencing it. But once I've got this built and loaded in Visual Studio, if I go back into rocks and change some stuff, it won't show up here because effectively Visual Studio locks on that built first built instance, more or less. Again, hand waving here, but that's essentially what's happening. And so that can be a little problematic because it's like, hey, I just changed something. I want to see that work and it won't show up here. So what you have to do is shut down and start Visual Studio up again. Not ideal, but you have that's something you just have to do. Or what I've seen some people do is just build, if they have a project like this, they will build that project on the command line and just do that separately outside of Visual Studio. Okay, because then that that doesn't have that locking characteristic. Okay. So again, something to keep in mind, if you're building a source generator, you use Visual Studio and you wanna test your stuff this way and you should, you're gonna to have to restart Visual Studio to have those changes light up. That's why I have two test projects because I can test my changes in a unit test project and that doesn't have that locking behavior. It will automatically light up right away. Only in this project is that going to happen, okay? The last thing I wanna mention here real quick is I keep talking about compiler API. I keep talking about Project Roslyn and syntax trees and semantic models. If you're going to build a source generator, you need to become fairly familiar with this API. Okay, and that's no small feat. This is a this is a quite complicated API. And if you think about everything that needs to happen with a compiler, it's not unsurprising. There's a whole bunch of stuff that goes on within within Roslyn and what you can find in the compiler API. And sometimes what you think you see in code isn't necessarily what's gonna show up in the compiler API. So I'm just gonna pull this little piece of code here and just show this um, where I wanna do this. It doesn't really matter. We'll just throw it in this file here. Okay. 
one thing to pick up, it's giving me red squiggles here because I didn't put this in the namespace. Shut up, Visual Studio. We don't care about that. What we care about is the fact that I have a method here in an interface that's sealed. Kind of odd, okay? But you can do this. Interfaces over the last four or five years have had a whole bunch of new features added to them. So they, they aren't the simple interfaces that you use in C Sharp like 20 years ago. Now, I'm not gonna bring this up. In, no, I can, I actually can. That's right, Jason, do that. Okay, so let's go into view here. I love when you um, talk to yourself, that's my favorite. <laughs> I do it all the time. Um, <laughs> It should be in here. Syntax visualizer. Yes. So this is, if you install the SDK into Visual Studio, this is one of the um, windows that you get. Okay. So you notice if I'm clicking over on my code, that syntax tree on, on the left is kind of moving around to what is actually being referenced in the tree. So if I click on this method and I zoom in over here, you'll notice that I clicked on the void keyword that's here, but that's actually on a method declaration, okay? So this tool is very handy when you wanna get familiar with the compiler API. If I'm on the method declaration here and I say view symbol, okay? Now, you see this method as a sealed method. So would you expect on an I method symbol for is sealed to be true? The answer is yes. That's what Jason would think. Okay. That's what I, yeah, I'd expect that to be I true. I would think that too. But if we dive into what's actually in the API here, and I'll zoom in on that, it's false. Huh. Now there's reasons why, but the point of why I'm bringing this up is when you look at your code and then you look at what's in the compiler API with syntax trees and semantic models and so on, what you think maybe what you're assuming and won't actually be the case when your code is actually running and you discover declarations like this. This won't be sealed even though there is a seal keyword there. And there's cases that I've run into this in other places where what I expected to show up in the compiler API with certain values isn't what actually is there. So, you know, that that's where writing a source generator can also be a little bit more of a barrier to entry because how that works may not be the way your mental model is initially. Okay, so that's also something you wanna keep in mind. So with all of that said, and I've been talking for so very long, um, I do wanna just end up with the, the point of saying to people that, you know, source generators are great. They are really cool. I, I, I love writing them, in fact, uh, my friend Rocky Laka, he's written CSLA for many, many, many years. Uh, on a whim, I just decided to create a source generator to serialize his business object types. And the initial results from benchmarking is it's going to be faster and it's going to consume less memory. So again, there's really cool places where you can use this, okay? But you don't have to create a source generator to do it. You can use other avenues to be able to create that code. If you do decide to create a source generator, there are things that I've mentioned in this discussion that you wanna keep in mind. There's also some other links that I provided to our hosts that like a whole series of articles that came from Andrew Locke that talk about how to build a source generator and test it and so on. And you, you wanna look those things up and read those as well because you, you don't wanna get bit as you're, bit as you're writing these. And a lot of people that have written them have been bit and they want to help in, in helping you avoid getting those bites or those paper cuts as you're developing your source generator. Okay. So um, what did I miss? <laughs> what questions did I miss? <laughs> there was one question I saw a little while ago about uh, showing an alias. Of a, I'm not sure if you did oh, show yes. something. Um, I mentioned it. Um, Aliasing that, a... Uh, Package or project reference, right? Yeah, I'm just yeah. trying to find it again in this in the chat so I, we can feature it. I think what you do is on your package reference here is it's either on the package reference itself. I don't have them <laughs> showing up here because on my test project, the way I do this, you know, there's a lot of details of this, but I'm basically trying to find all the types I could write mocks for, and then I have rocks generate the mocks and see if there's any errors in doing that. So here you see with 
I suppose I've created an alias in my code this way. But this is just look up for NuGet package references. And this also works for project references. How do I alias a package reference? And I, I think there's an alias keyword in your project file that I that you add somewhere again and just say, I'm going to use that alias for all the types within this package. And that's how that works. That's cool. I have another one here. How do you generate code from the string using syntax factory? Uh, don't. <laughs> but thank you for thank you for reminding me because that's one point I, I, I went over and it was in my list and I forgot about that, which is when you generate your code, if I come back to my source generator here and no, not the attribute. I want to bring up the generator. Down here, I said, this is where I'm adding my source. And if you look at the text property here, that's a source text property or a source text type. So in source, in add source here, actually in my builder, and again, this is just something I've created in my code. Once I get done building all of my code, I end up creating a source text from. And that source text from is just this list of strings or just string content. So at the end of the day, when you build your source generator, you have to create strings. How you do this is kind of up to you, but it's actually recommended not to use a syntax factory or syntax trees and build them up to generate a string for your code. You may think, well, that makes sense because don't I get some validity to the source, the, the syntax tree and things should be correct? Potentially, but the syntax tree um, is very verbose. And it can actually be, I don't want to say it's slow because that's not the, the, the intent, but it can take a lot of code to build up a syntax tree. Whereas if you're going to create code, you might actually just want to create a string, use raw string literals. That's what I use. And I also use the indented text writer, which ironically comes from system code DOM compiler. But this allows me to create code that's going to have indents and outdents. You can also use templating libraries. There's a open source project called Scriben. And that's one that people have used to generate their strings for source generators, okay? But whatever you do, you wanna use something that's string-based. Don't use a syntax tree. Um, that, that can actually be a lot more work than you're expecting. Okay. Anything else? What Lang version? Oh, thanks, Stefan. <laughs> I know who he is. Um, what language ver version do you choose to submit in your source generator? Um, I try to with rocks. Um, the, the way I've done it is I basically build code or I emit code that's going to work with the latest version of C Sharp. So in this case, if you're using C Sharp 12, that'll work just fine. Now, again, I, I'm the author of this framework. That's my choice. You may and probably want to, based on where your source generator is going to be run, to say, I want to maybe allow people that are on a previous version of C Sharp where, um, or .NET that I can only generate code that will work in those versions or in, in that kind of environment space. So you can do that. There, there are ways in writing a source mm -hmm. generator to say, what is the, the current context that I am in? What, what's like the version of C-sharp or, or things like that? So I may change the change, like to, to change the code that I'm gonna create a little bit differently. But that again is a decision that you have to make. Again, for rocks, my decision is I'm trying to stay as current as I possibly can. Um, and, and that has some good things, but it also potentially has some disadvantages to that as well. It's, it's really up to you. Well, if there are no more questions, is there anything you want to say to tie it all together before we close out this this stream, Jason? I would just say, you know, that this feature is one that's like it's now been out there for about three-ish years. It is finding its way, as they say, into the box, but nobody delivers software in a box anymore. That's just a <laughs> an old timer phrase, so to speak. But it's now in the box. You know, some of those examples I mentioned before, especially with regular expressions where .NET itself is using source generators. So it, it has its place. It can lead to some very elegant solutions given the right context. So if you've never played with source generators before and building them, even though 
I may have come across a little bit in some places where, you know, you really, really want to think about maybe not doing it. But I also want to say, give it a whirl, give it a try. It's, it is very powerful. And there are some very, very cool things you can do with it. So if you've never used source, build a source generator before, I would encourage you to at least give it a whirl and see what it's like. Very good. Very good. All right. Well, thank you, Jason, for coming by again and, and a deep dive um, into, into uh, source generators. Your, your, your depth and breadth of knowledge on this topic is, is frankly a, a little disorienting. <laughs> um, but we really appreciate you having you, uh, have, having you on the show. Uh, this is a great, uh, great topic. Um, I'll thank you real quick. Um, sure. maybe I'll come back in three years. And by that time, I'll just say, you know, <laughs> use Copilot to build your source generator and you won't even have to think about this. Anymore, so. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. And you don't have to wait three years. If you want to come back uh, before then, by all means, you're, you're always welcome on our stream. All right, um, thank so thank you everyone for watching, uh, on .NET live. Uh, please check out our other great .NET live TV streams and videos on .NET slash live. And come back next week to see us when we're going to be hosting Sander Tenbrenka and Brian Chavez talking about EF core data seeding with Bogus. Um, everyone have a good week. See you then. And don't stare. If you're in North America, don't stare at the sun this afternoon. <laughs> awesome. Bye, everyone. See ya. Thank you.